I'm Indy Nidell. I'm Spartacus Olson. And this is Into Context, a Time Ghost historical format where we give historical context to the headlines of today. In this set of episodes, the war in Ukraine. Two days ago, the Russians bombed the Babin Yar Memorial, a sacred site of remembrance for tens of thousands of victims of the Nazis from multiple massacres during World War II. The bombing was not a mistake. They targeted a TV tower that is on the site to knock out public communications in total disregard for what they were striking. It did not damage the memorial itself, but it hit ground that is the resting place of the victims. Now, contrary to what the Putin disinformation campaign will tell you, the Ukrainians rose up en masse against Nazism during World War II. Over four million Ukrainians served in the Red Army. And by 1944, 40% of the entire Soviet armed forces were Ukrainians. Countless thousands more joined the partisans to fight the German occupation. The people of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic also suffered the highest percentage of casualties of all Soviet republics and the second biggest casualty rate from Nazi crimes against humanity after Poland. 1.6 million Ukrainians died fighting for the Red Army in World War II, and 3.7 million civilians were killed as collateral damage or murdered by the Nazis and their helpers. And of that 3.7 million, 40% of them, 1.5 million, were Ukrainian Jews. Like with most national ethnicities, including Russians, by the way, some Ukrainians did collaborate with the Nazis, but they constituted a small minority of the Ukrainian people. Most were either victims of or fought the Nazis. It is this national tragedy that the Ukrainians commemorate at Babin Yar. In the last two days of September 1941, over 30,000 Jews, men, women, and children, were murdered there. Over the course of the war, another 60,000, mostly Jews, but also other ethnicities, including ethnic Russians, were murdered at the site. When the war ended, the site was purposefully forgotten as part of the Soviet effort to avoid talking about victims of the Nazis as being Jewish and focusing on the tragedy of World War II as an anti-communist event. When the Soviet Union was dissolved in 1991, the newly sovereign Ukrainian state came together with the Jewish community to create a memorial and continue research into the personal identity of each victim. It is as much a Jewish as a Ukrainian story the memory of yet another mass murder against the Ukrainian people that the Russian armed forces have now desecrated while perpetrating yet another aggression on the Ukrainian people. Spartacus made an episode covering the Babin Yar massacre a year and a half ago on our timeline when it happened on the World War II channel. We've edited out the other events of that half year to give you a deeper understanding of the tragedy and to keep the memory of the victims alive. It is hard to watch, but is an essential part of Ukrainian, Jewish, and human history must not be forgotten. On September 19, as Indy covered in the World War II episode of that date, German forces take Kiev, one of the major prizes of the Soviet Union. The 29th Army Corps of the Wehrmacht under General Hans von Obstfelder imposes a row of anti-Jewish measures. On the 22nd, all Jewish men are arrested to forcibly work for the Germans, those that are left, that is. Mostly the very young and the very old, as the vast majority of Jewish adult men have left the city as evacuees or as Red Army soldiers. The Wehrmacht also orders Jewish civilians to start clearing the city of mines, a potentially deadly job made worse by that Soviet forces have set timed explosives as they leave, and that a handful of NKVD operatives remain in the city to disrupt the German occupation. The bombs kill dozens of German soldiers and staff officials. The sources are vague about this, but either the Wehrmacht commander of Kiev, Major General Kurt Eberhardt, or Wehrmacht General Hans von Obstfelder, commanding the 29th Corps, demand that the SD shoot all Jews in the city in retaliation for the bombings. Two days after the bombing, von Obstfelder meets 6th Army Commander Field Marshal General Walter von Reichenau, and it is most likely that he approves the planned reprisals in that meeting. On the 26th, Eberhardt meets with Jekyll, SS Brigadeführer Dr. Otto Rasch, 
in charge of Einsatzgruppe C, and Paul Blobel, commanding Sonderkommando 4A. They planned the murder of all of Kiev's remaining Jews, which they estimate to number 5,000. They assigned the murdering to Blobel and the Sonderkommando 4A, aided by the 45th and 303rd police battalions under commanders Martin Bessa and Heinrich Hannibal, men from Yekens SS Order Police Staff and probably elements of the Ukrainian Bukovinian Battalion. In total, 1,500 men. Ammunition and logistics are provided by the Wehrmacht. The first Jews to die are those who were arrested by the Wehrmacht on the 22nd, as well as any Jewish POWs. They are shot on the 27th. But how do you kill thousands of people without causing massive panic or resistance? Deception. On the 28th, the 6th Army tasks the Ukrainian police to put up 2,000 posters around the city, ordering all of Kiev's Jews to gather at the corner of Melninkova and Doktorivska on the 29th. Failure to comply is under penalty of death. They are to bring all their documents, money, valuables, warm clothes, and linen. A rumor is spread that they are being resettled, but many are apprehensive. Two teenage sisters, Frida and Chaya Lev, from the 40 Turgenev Street, are seen running on the street, screaming, they will kill us. Still, many do believe, or at least hope, that they will only be resettled. Most of those that have doubts will still comply out of fear for the announced death penalty. To many of us, it may seem extremely naive, but we should remember that these people have lived under the Soviet authorities for two decades, subject to violent reprisal for any kind of disobedience. So, early in the morning of the 29th, more than 30,000 people, both Jewish people and their non-Jewish spouses, men, but mostly women, children, babies, and the elderly, make their way through Melnik Street in the direction of the Lukyanivka train station and the Jewish cemetery. They are packed for a long journey, and on their way to the station, they are met by cars with smiling Germans and people telling them to hurry, since the first train has already left the station. Fedor Fidio, a Ukrainian engineer, will recall, many thousands of people, mainly elderly, but middle-aged people were also not lacking, were moving towards Babinyar. And the children, my God, there were so many children. All this was moving, burdened with luggage and children. Here and there, old, sick people who lacked the strength to move by themselves were carried on carts without any assistance, probably by sons or daughters. Some cried, others consoled. Most were moving in a self-absorbed way in silence and with a doomed look. It was a terrible sight. Höfer, a German truck driver, will remember his drive to the ravine. On the way there, we overtook Jews carrying luggage, marching on foot in the same direction that we were traveling. There were whole families. The further we got out of the town, the denser the columns became. Just before the entrance of the Jewish cemetery, the group of Jews pass through a roadblock where their Jewishness is confirmed by Ukrainian clerks and non-Jews are asked to return. Around the checkpoint, the road taken by the column deviates from the route to the train station. Instead, they continue west to the Jewish cemetery, behind which lies a big ravine called Babi Yar. At the roadblock, the group is separated in smaller groups, in which they continue their walk, guarded by soldiers with machine guns. They arrive at a large pile of belongings and tables with Ukrainian guards. The Ukrainians lead them past a number of different places where, one after the other, they had to remove their luggage, and their coats, shoes, and overgarments, and also underwear. They also had to leave their valuables in a designated place. There was a special pile for each article of clothing. It all happened very quickly, and anyone who hesitated was kicked or pushed by the Ukrainians to keep them moving. I don't think it was even a minute from the time each Jew took off his coat before he was standing there completely naked. Most now know what awaits them. Many start to scream, others sink away in fatalistic silence or are in denial. Some make plans to escape, while others fear for their lives and those of their relatives if they do. But it is too late. They now pass a cordon of German policemen with dogs and clubs, which they swing at them every chance they get. 
They are led deep into the ravine where several men of the Sonde Commando Fia A and the 45th Police Battalion are lined up. There are multiple accounts of the following moments, either by perpetrators, bystanders, or the very, very few survivors. Kurt Werner, member of the Sonde Commando Fia A, will make this account. As soon as I arrived at the execution area, I was sent down to the bottom of the ravine with some of the other men. It was not long before the first Jews were brought to us over the side of the ravine. The Jews had to lie face down on the earth by the ravine walls. There were three groups of marksmen down at the bottom of the ravine, each made up of about 12 men. Groups of Jews were sent down to each of these execution squads simultaneously. Each successive group of Jews had to lie down on top of the bodies of those that had already been shot. The marksmen stood behind the Jews and killed them with a shot in the neck. I still recall today the complete terror of the Jews when they first caught sight of the bodies as they reached the top edge of the ravine. Many Jews cried out in terror. It's almost impossible to imagine what nerves of steel it took to carry out that dirty work down there. It was horrible. I had to spend the whole morning down in the ravine. For some of the time, I had to shoot continuously. Then I was given the job of loading submachine gun magazines with ammunition. While I was doing that, other comrades were assigned to shooting duty. Towards midday, we were called away from the ravine, and in the afternoon, I, with some of the others up at the top, had to lead the Jews to the ravine. While we were doing this, there were other men shooting down in the ravine. Others are taking more than just lives. One witness recalls. The opposite side of the ravine, seven or so Germans brought two young Jewish women. They went down lower to the ravine, chosen even place, and began to rape these women by turns. When they became satisfied, they stabbed the women with daggers so that they even did not cry out. And they left the bodies like this, naked, with their legs open. Almost none of the victims survived to tell the tale. One of the few who does is 30-year-old Dina Ponicheva. As she and her family realize what is about to happen, her mother advises her to hide, telling her, you don't look like a Jew, and she decides to escape. She has a Russian husband and surname and tells one of the men at the undressing tables that she's not Jewish. She's ordered to wait until the day's work is finished. As she waits to be released, she sees her parents and sister walk off to be shot. At the end of the 29th, the Germans decide that she too should be executed. She has seen too much. Through the settling darkness, she and a few others are led to the edge of the ravine. As the Germans begin to shoot, she jumps into the ravine where she pretends to be dead. After waiting for hours amid the dead bodies of her fellow victims, she crawls out and disappears into the darkness. She has escaped the fate of the 22,000 murdered on that day. The next day, 12,000 more are killed. In the evening of the 30th, the edges of the ravine are blown up with dynamite by Soviet POWs, who then proceed to cover the corpses under a rubble of dirt and stone. Chekhan's office reports that in total, 33,171 have been killed at Babi Yar. Most of them are the elderly, women, and children. The youngest victim is two weeks old, and among them are the Lev sisters, Frida and Chaya, who warned of what was to come. They were 14 and 17 years old. The Holocaust by bullets, the shooting of entire Jewish populations in Eastern European cities, is now the primary method for the eradication of the Jews. Two days to eradicate an entire community. Two long days of bloody, messy, robbing, humiliating, raping, and murdering perfectly normal people like you, me, our children, our parents, grandparents, and our infants. Never forget. Ooh.